It is a well-known and uncontroversial fact that a profound shift in the European culture of punishment began to take place in the 18th century. The most significant aspect of this transformation may well be the turn away from torture as an instrument for the search of truth or for the enforcement of confessions and from ordeal as a publicly celebrated spectacle of punishment. What is also important, however, is the ongoing questioning and partial abolition of the death penalty in the context of a general problematization of the right of the state to be the master of its citizens' lives and the birth of the prison as the main locus of the penal system. On the basis of available investigations, it would not be difficult to demonstrate this transformation and to illustrate its continuing relevance in the present. Yet I do not wish to go down this road here. While it may appear relatively simple to describe the historical processes involved in this evolution of punishment, it is difficult to understand exactly what these processes were caused by and what has led to their at least partial success. In order to understand the possibility of a defense or a continued promotion of the modern European or Western culture of punishment in today's world, although there are significant differences between Europe and the US at the moment in this regard, it is extremely important to examine what happened in the 18th century. Metaphorically speaking, we stand undoubtedly on the shoulders of the reformers of that time. Thus it seems reasonable to begin by commenting on two important and enormously influential interpretations of this development. My main objective, however, is to go beyond the analysis of the benefits and weaknesses of these two predominant interpretations by presenting a tentative outline of a third, an alternative approach, which does justice both to the epochal events at the time and to contemporary tendencies. Hence, this lecture tries to offer an analysis of the exemplary case of this exemplary case of a value shift and to propose a theory which could also serve as a practical guide for the analysis of other cases. So I will tell three stories, so to speak, three narratives about the same set of events. The first story to be told, according to this plan, could be titled The Myth of the Enlightenment. The second is Foucault. And the third is my proposal to tell this story as a story of the sacralization of the person. The literary form of this enlightenment myth can be found in the heroic epic. The hero of this epic would be a young and rather shy Milanese intellectual who at the age of 25 and after intense discussions in his circle of friends, sits down to write a manuscript in less than a year, which is then publishes anonymously, not in Milan, that belonged to Austria at the time, but due to the strict censorship there in the Grand Duchy of Tuscany in the year 1764. I'm speaking about Cesare Beccaria, and his treatise, De Diliti e delle Pene, on crimes and punishments. This book, which shortly after its appearance was put on the index of banned books, turned out to be a huge success, published in several editions, translated into other languages, including German and English. In terms of its overall influence, the French edition is the most important one for it was read by such leading French Enlightenment figures as Voltaire, Diderot, and d'Alembert. One of Beccaria's friends, Pietro Verri, summarized the historical impact of the book as follows, I quote, Verri, 1776, abuse and torture, these dreadful practices, were either eliminated or at least moderated in the trials of all states and this is the achievement of only one book, this book by Beccaria. Here we have the ingredients of a story adored by Enlightenment intellectuals. 
in a simplified manner, the story could be summarized like this for a long time, but for reasons still incomprehensible, even at present, habits, customs, and prejudices have determined people's lives. These still contemporary practices have now lost their meaning, if they have ever had any meaning in the first place, and are to be conceived as mere relics to which the present continues to cling, either out of lethargy or because they represent the specific interests of certain people. Beccaria calls the prevailing rules of the system of punishment the residue of the most barbarous centuries. I quote, a few odd remnants of the laws of an ancient conquering race codified 1,200 years ago by a prince ruling at Constantinople and since jumbled together with the customs of the Lombards in Milan and bundled up in the rambling volumes of obscure academic interpreters, this is what makes up the tradition of opinion that passes for law across a large portion of Europe. To counter these barbaric practices, we need to rely on one brave and solitary initiative, that philosopher who had the courage to scatter out among the multitudes from his humble despised study the first seeds of those beneficial truths that would be so long in bearing fruit. That philosopher deserves the gratitude of all humanity, says Beccaria in a later edition. With his insights, he seeks to address the hearts of the few wise men spread around the world. At the same time, however, he hopes that the great monarchs, the human benefactors who rule us, love the truths which are expounded by humble philosophers with an unfanatical zeal. He thereby values the idea of setting out the confusion of the old laws in a style designed to ward off the unenlightened and impatient run of men. Against these age-old prejudices and barbaric practices, Beccaria, an isolated but determined intellectual, proposes an alternative conception. This conception is presented not as the newly created work of this particular thinker, but as a revival of the simplest fundamental principles whose validity evident prior to all history, had been concealed by history. I quote again, it is therefore only after they have experienced thousands of miscarriages in matters essential to life and liberty and have grown weary of suffering the most extreme ills that men set themselves to right the evils that beset them and to grasp the most palpable truths which, by virtue of their simplicity, escape the minds of the common run of men, who are not used to analyzing things, but instead passively take on a whole set of second-hand impressions of them, derived more from tradition than from inquiry. 